Hi everyone, my name is Darian Moses and welcome to another episode of A Fireside Chat with us. Today I am here with Ricky Gerson, Phil Tomlinson, and Alex Bogdanovsky, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about digital media and the trust and safety space. So, guys, what do we think about trends in the trust and safety and digital media space today? Where is the industry going these days? Wow, that's, there's a lot there to unpack, but I would start by saying that the challenges in trust and safety are at their heart the same, right? There are bad people with bad intentions wanting to use platforms to either amplify a bad message or to inflict some sort of harm, whether that's for a financial motivation in the, in the case of like spams or scam or fraud, or sometimes a per personal motivation in the, in the cases of bullying and harassment, sometimes a political motivation in the case of misinformation. But at, at its heart, it's just really an evolution of classic human behavior that's been there since the dawn of the internet and actually way back, way back when. So I think when we try frame this as there's sort of this inflection point um, it's, it, I think it's driven primarily by the, just the sheer weight of content. There's so much of it, right? Like billions and billions and billions of images, videos, text, messages every single day, more than anyone could ever keep up with. So it's the sheer scale of it that is daunting. And that's, mm -hmm. that's challenging for most of the large platforms and, and many of the, uh, the smaller ones too. And secondly, the sophistication of some of the bad actors, right? So when I started off in the space, 15 years ago, we were primarily dealing with, th there were some of those things as well, right? There was politically motivated stuff and there, there was some of the challenges we see today, but primarily the big problems online were things like, like spam, right? Like some, some of the platforms like Twitter were like full of spam and that was like the biggest problem. And that's not really a problem anymore in the sense that uh, it's not the thing that I know keeps pe folks up at night anymore. That has changed and now we're seeing the rise of what I would call like one to many uh, harm. So things like misinformation, right? Where the intent is not to bully or harass an individual. The attempt is to try and inject false narratives out into the world that follow some political agenda or some personal agenda or some factional agenda, right? And you see that certainly around US politics, but you see it all over the world, right? And so, so while the behaviors at their core are the same, how they are transpiring has changed. Mm -hmm. And it's just gotten so sophisticated. Like anyone can create information that looks right or accurate or seems to be validated by some source, yeah. but it, it's wrong or it's false and, mm -hmm. and it gets spread so quickly these days. Like if you think back 10, 20 years ago, that would have been hard to create. Now you've got so many yeah. tools at your disposal, like anyone could. Yeah, you used to have to drop leaflets from an airplane right. onto a war zone. Mm -hmm. Now you can do it all from you know, the bedroom. Yep. I think of it more of like a, a baseline level. What is the point of the platform? Generally, it's to bring people together to meet with one another or share pictures of their children or connect with old friends and family or current friends and family. Or in the case of TikTok, which I think is more of an entertainment <laughs> channel almost, it's to feed entertainment. And I don't think of trust and safety immediately like, like uh, going into like the really hectic, toxic stuff with the bad actors, but more so than like where, where does the point reach? What is the point where the value that you're going for is starting to diminish, whether it's through toxicity or just yeah. over, like over too much advertisements, mm -hmm. I think like drastically reduces the value I'm getting. The quality from of the, experience. Yeah, the quality sure. of the experience. Sure. And so it's not, while it is totally encompassing of all the bad toxic stuff that's po policy violating or even harmful or disinformation, it's simply like, when does it start to detract from the value that the platform's meant to provide? Mm -hmm. So I think it's everything from counterfeit products and um, friction with regards to transacting and like the sketchiness that comes from any yeah. sort of commerce piece of the platform, it can be, slowly you're like tra your viewpoints are transforming because of you're ingesting so much content yeah. that's one type yeah. that you're actually starting to believe that way and it's harder sure. to catch yeah and there have been studies done about exactly that phenomenon of 
focuses viewpoint gradually shifting over time because of the sheer volume of exposure to, to, to one type of narrative, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we've, we've seen it in content moderation teams at companies. If your job is to do content moderation day after day after day, and even though you're not reading the content in a news, um, uh, through a news filter, you're reading it in the course of your job and you know that you're performing a task, if you're just exposed to constant information that says you know, mm -hmm. this thing is good and this thing is bad, your brain starts to move in a direction and yeah. you, you begin to form extreme view viewpoints. The hardest part of that is that, like the counter lever is we want people to have the freedom of speech across these platforms and it's like how do you, how do you give that but then also have a yeah. defense mechanism where people are abusing that and yeah. then doing the wrong things with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah love definitely. To then something you said resonated with, with me, Alex. You know, you mentioned your freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So as the, I guess, the only non-US resident live, uh, in, this, in this chat, it's interesting. As a South African from Ireland. As yes. a South African who lives in Ireland, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in the US, but the, you know, freedom of speech is not a universal principle. Right. It is mm -hmm. a fundamentally American principle. Yeah. The First Amendment, that does not translate. You, know, you go to Germany, or you go to, you, you, in, the, in Germany, you cannot, it is illegal to deny the Holocaust. Yeah. It, is a, it is illegal to display Nazi paraphernalia. Yeah. Now, those are extreme examples. There's a lot of other speech that is a, a technically illegal, which you know, that, that idea of something is illegal to say, Mm -hmm. is to, to in the US is, is almost like offensive does not, com does granted. not compute mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and I'm not I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong it's mm -hmm. just the, you know I think one of the challenges that a lot of the tech platforms in particular are faced because they are primarily US headquartered with US leaders and a US philosophy at its heart right. how, how they're trying to export those principles to places where the idea is not just uh, foreign but potentially mm -hmm. dangerous mm -hmm. you know the bad behavior, the toxic behavior, that's trust and safety, adverse actors. What do, do we know the makeup of them? Like what percentage is actually like troll farms mm. versus just like pain, <clears throat> pain in the butt teenagers that are just being like kind of teenage yeah. boys yeah. Yeah. wreaking havoc? Like what's the makeup? Yeah. So I don't know the exact split, but I can tell you that the vast majority of, of Consumers of content on the internet and people who use these platforms have played no part in this. Yeah. The, right. the huge majority of people spend most of their time just wanting to get by and have a good time and yeah. do, do use the platform in the way it was intended. Yeah. There is a small minority that is made up of a combination of some of the things you said. It's, it's maybe young folks who are maybe ignorant to the exponential harm that their activities can cause, mm -hmm. or it's professional bad actors who are maybe acting on behalf of a state or behalf of a, 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 a third party interest. And then there's sort of, I would call like the, 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 the collateral damage, folks who end up being dragged into, yeah. like, you know, back in the early days of the internet, you had these like flame wars on forums. Yeah, right. And it would be like someone, and you see it today on Reddit and other platforms, someone would post a doesn't even have to be a controversial opinion. Right. Some opinion, and someone else has an opposing opinion, yep. and then all of a sudden people pile in on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it becomes yeah. a thousand posts later, and then at, someone leaves the platform and another person calls someone, someone a Nazi, and, mm -hmm. and that's like almost can, an inevitable. Yeah. You see that in like right? every, any comment section for any yeah. article. There's Don't an article the about like bread being baked yep. today. And yep. suddenly there's yeah. a huge yeah. fight in the comments. Yep. And it's all like anonymous, anonymous, anonymous. It's where you think yeah. like it's bots just fighting with each other. Yeah. But then you see like a guy, Michael from Pennsylvania, he's getting in and it's like, Michael, yeah. just why? Sure. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> don't waste your time. And you know what? That's a, you don't see that generally in normal society. Yeah. If I go up to the bar now and I say something about you know, vaguely, maybe controversial, some, you know, generally people will want to kind of have a conversation and or they'll ignore you yeah. online. It's like, it's like when you're driving your car, you'll say things to other drivers in the car. Yeah. You would never say to another human being yeah, totally. check right. online, totally. ever. So with all the things that have been going on in this space, how, how can these companies earn digital trust back from their consumers on their platform? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, for a start, I think they need to have very clear rules and guidelines about what is acceptable content. Those need to be articulated both externally and, and made clear to the people who use the platform about what's allowed and what's not. That needs to be articulated internally so that they have consistent decision making about what they take down and when they take it down and that this clear communication when something is removed or when something's left up about why that's happened. Mm -hmm. They also need 
technology to help because of the fact that, as I said earlier, there's so much content. You, you, you can never do it with humans, right? right? Humans have a role to play in content moderation. They bring expertise, they bring language skills, they bring nuance about a, a market or nuance about an issue, but they, the scale that's required means you have to use AI and you have to use technology as well. Most companies deploy a combination of both. So you'll use AI to do sort of top of the funnel detection, sort of at the content creation stage. You know, think hundreds of millions or even billions of pieces of content. Mm -hmm. Then a subset of that, that the AI either can't solve or is unsure about, gets passed to a human being. They then make a final moderation decision. And in the best systems, those decisions that the humans are, are making are fed back up to the top of the funnel to improve the algorithm. The, the other thing I wanted to say is traditionally, and, and certainly for the first, you know, call it the first 10, 15 years of the industry up until a couple of years ago, the onus was very squarely on the platforms themselves to self-police. Right. That is changing. So you said, how will companies ensure digital trust? They are being forced to. Yep. Reg by, regula by regulators and governments around the world who are taking more and more interest in how co companies are thinking about content, how transparent they're being, how they're taking it down, how they're articulating their rules and guidelines, what speech is being left up and what speech isn't. They're being held accountable, not just in the eyes of governments and regulators, but also now by the broader society. So there is a groundswell of reasons why these companies So it's to becoming around. a need for companies to address it's, it. It's an existential need, yeah. You, you describe <clears throat> that filtering process with leveraging AI and then humans, the people who are creating this bad content fighting against the bots, are they coming up with plans that are going to sort of yep. circumvent that? Yeah, and they, they always have. Back to the early days when, when we, you know, the only technology you really had was, was dictionary matching. Right. You know, you take, a, you take a bad word and you substitute an I for an exclamation or you yep. su substitute a, you know. A number one. Yeah, right. So we've all done it. Um, I'm sure that's your password today. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, word substitution is at its simplest level. But, but, you know, as detection technology becomes more sophisticated, the attempts to evade it also become more sophisticated. And folks will do all sorts of things, including ob obfuscating metadata, uh, including you know, doing, pretty, doing pretty technically advanced image alteration and, and, and manipulation, um, doing things to videos to get around copyright blockers mm -hmm. so that their videos don't get take that, taken down of YouTube. Right. You know, there's a, there's some, and it's, it's all, I think of it as like water flowing down a hill. You put a rock in the way, it's going to cause find a, a dam, it. but mm -hmm. it's going to find a way around it because that, the inertia just, just takes it down. Right? So it's a constant process mm -hmm. of continuing to address these challenges as they come it, around. It, it is. It, it's constantly a little bit like whack-a-mole, like, oh, there's this new thing, and mm -hmm. now I have to build this new technology, or I have to change what I've already built, and that'll always be the case. It's adversarial by nature, right? Yep, for sure. It's almost like the trick is not to outwit and outlast every bad piece of content or what f the future might hold, but to have a well-oiled engine or a machine or mechanism for a process that allows you to iterate as quick as the com yeah. uh, not competition, but the, your opponent the challenger. Yeah. Is, is iterating. So you can just react yeah. in near real time. There's no perfect system. It's going to be about consistency mm -hmm. and clarity. Yeah. Right. If you want to be the kind of platform that allows certain types of speech, or maybe you allow adult content, that's fine. There, there are there are swim lanes for you to operate in. Yeah. You can think of com companies like OnlyFans. You can yeah. think of, you know, even Twitter, right? Who who allows adult content and, and some speech that a lot of other platforms don't. That's a product and a philosoph philosophical choice they've made. Yeah. But okay, cool. Then be consistent. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And then then your your the people who use your platform and the people who work in your teams that that keep your platform safe, understand where are those boundaries and how to operate within them. Yeah, I think the strategy should also <clears throat> allocate, you know, there's a, there's a bias, of course, to spend the bulk of your budget protecting your home market. Mm -hmm. So for the US, for instance, if you have, if you're only generating, let's say, X revenue a year, and you're gonna allocate a fraction of that to fighting trust and safety, because anything more than that, you're gonna be losing money and you'll be out of business soon. The bulk of that has, I mean, that allocation, that budget has to be allocated globally, but there will be a tendency to spend it where you are, where you yourself is based. So if you're an American company, you're gonna spend it on protecting the American market. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean to yeah, the, rest the, the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. And so I think that bringing in AI versus people is kind of what are those low cost but very efficient tools like AI that can be pushed out and should be pushed out with 
some human complementary services outside of your home market, so you can focus the bulk mm. of your yeah. capital against fighting your home market. Yeah. Darren, you're a big user of social media. What I are am. you thinking about? It's interesting. It's interesting. Like being in my 20s, everybody has social media. We, I was in the generation that grew up with social networks and keeping accounts private versus public. I'm guilty of having my, my social accounts as public accounts at one point in time and realizing after learning all about the trust and safety world mm -hmm. and how, how many dangers there are out there, mm -hmm. I've made everything private. I don't want anything out there at this point. So it's definitely really interesting to think about like being a user of Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and Reddit and Twitter and all the different social platforms we can think of, it, it's honestly a little bit daunting sometimes. And I always love to talk with my friends about this and family about, hey, make sure that you're staying protected all the time. Mm. It's a, a weird concept to wrap our heads around because we use social networks and we yeah. use the internet to connect. That's the point yeah. of why the internet was created, so that people across locations across the world can connect in a, in a really awesome way. This is incredible that we're able to, I can call up somebody or, or message somebody on some platform who lives in Malaysia or who mm -hmm. lives in, I don't know, Greece, and just have a great conversation with them. Mm -hmm. But do I always know who those people yeah. are? For me personally, yes, because I don't try to reach out to people I don't know, but there is that risk of yeah. maybe at some point I'm not talking to somebody that I actually do know even though I think I did. Right. So, or even a person, period. Right, or a, or a yeah. person. It could be a bot entirely. I have no idea who I'm talking to sometimes. Yeah. Do you think, in your experience, are there platforms that are doing maybe better than others in terms of educating their users about how to stay safe as you, as you sign up and as you use the platform. I haven't made any new social accounts mm -hmm. in a long time because I feel like the market is so saturated at yeah. this point that I don't want to have to have another social network to keep up with. But I definitely have had people tell me, oh, it was really interesting. I created this new platform or a new account on a new platform and I got prompted with, uh, are you over the age of something? Mm -hmm. Which when I was 11 years old making an Instagram, I didn't get that question. Mm. Versus uh, I've got plenty of family members who are a lot younger. I've got cousins who are 12, 13 and are like, hey, mom and dad won't let me get on this. Do they have the proper safety protocols mm. in place? So it's definitely interesting. I, I'm biased and I look into the policies a lot of the time and I'll go and search up in the settings and other things, what are their policies? Because I genu genuinely wanna know because we do a lot of work in this space. Yeah. So I'm aware of that. You're informed, yeah. Exactly, I'm informed, but not everybody's informed. Yeah. Majority of people, I would say, are not informed. You know, when you think about like policies and rules of engagement and, thing, and like cautions and things to watch out for, it's always in some like policy, privacy guidelines that's like seven clicks away yeah, from buried. some 355 yeah. page white paper right. on what is and isn't allowed that no one's yeah. ever going to look at. Right. And like even when you look at the terms of service for anything, everyone knows, no one reads, maybe a lawyer would, but no one reads that. Yeah. You just hit I agree and you move on as quickly as possible. And I think that behavior and, comp and brands and platforms that knowing that that's what people yeah. do, they want to just get it, make it frictionless. Yep. But I think what would be cooler is just how we get an ad every 30 seconds or every five swipes or every three comments or news feeds. Um, if there is, to just have a flash on the screen that says, remember, watch out for these mm. behaviors or remember, like, give yourself time to, to for a break. There's, yep. like, they, they know that's what, so easy that's to implement. So, so easy to do. Voice, yeah. And like, what, you know, if you could boil, boilerplate down your policy frameworks, again, one of those massive resource documents that no one actually looks at. Like almost like a mission statement or a bullet points or values that just flashes up yeah. before you use the app. Here are five things to remember before you sign on and then it just reminds you when you're yeah. getting out. Yeah. I mean, they, they push us like you're inactive or you have 15 comments or you got three likes. They mm -hmm. give you those notifications. What's wrong with the notification yeah. saying like, just remember, take everything with a grain on salt. Yeah, like a simple pump. push notification yeah, yeah. could suffice. Yeah. I want to ask you, because like when I think about social media, I worry about two groups. I worry about the kids, because mm. they're, you know, they're at risk being in, in a space where a lot of negative things are starting to happen yeah. more and more often. And I think about the elderly who came onto the platform because their kids say, hey, this is the way we, you can see photos yeah. of your family, and et cetera. Yeah. And they, then they become targets. How, how can companies yeah. um, take care of them. Yeah, you know. my, 
97-year-old grandfather before he died a couple of years ago was on Facebook. And I mean, look, he wasn't a power user, so <laughs> don't get me wrong, but the, he was on it. And he, he would send me messages and he would like my things and I would, he'd send me the odd poke. Remember yep. the poke? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was probably the only man in the world still using the poke. <laughs> That's great. And so to your point, right, people of all ages, I think the dangers are different for the different demographics. Certainly with folks on the older end of the spectrum tend to be targeted more by the kind of financial fraud mm -hmm. and scam and the, the kind of phishing type, you know, they're, they're, it's more financial. Yep. With children, obviously, there's, there's more overt dangers. And you're right, I think uh, platforms need to be thinking about the different groups of people who use their platforms and, and how to tailor a experience that's going to be most suitable for them. And I actually think, I, I was thinking about this when Ricky was talking about, companies have done a lot more in the last few years to make safety a little more prominent. Now, you know, most platforms have sort of a, a safety center. Yeah. It's usually one or two clicks from the home page. Also, you know, reporting stuff tends to be a little easier, right? Mm -hmm. you, you Previously, it was like filling out your taxes, right? Yeah. Right, now, now you can just push a button. Now you just click and it's like two clicks and, and the person is automatically blocked as well as reported. So there are product design improvements that are happening. Could they go further? Certainly. I think, I think you know, push notifications is an interesting one. Push notifications are primarily a growth driver, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a way of getting people who have maybe fallen off the app for a day or two to say, hey, come back, because these companies measure growth and performance in like terms of number of people who visit of course. in a day or a month or whatever. So I like the idea of using some of those um, notifications for, for pushing safety. I think some folks do. I mean, I, I, get, I mm -hmm. still get the occasional one from certain platforms. Hey, have you, is this still your phone number in case you lose it so you can log back in if you lose your password? Or, hey, have you updated your password recently? So there's more for sort of like a cyber or, uh, or infrastructure security um, I'd love to see them do more on the, for the security of content and, and safety of users. What do you do to keep your kids safe? What kind of things do you look out for? And what, do you, what recommendations would you make for parents that are trying to keep their children safe on platforms? Can you take it first? Yeah, I can go first. Mine's now an adult. So really hard to put any parameters around what she does. She mm -hmm. does what she wants to do. Yeah. But you know, in the early days, I was really worried about um, who she was talking to, would try to get access to her devices. Yeah. You know, kids figure ways around them, and I know Isabel did that many times, but that's, that's the type of things I was worrying about. Like who she's talking to, what they're saying to her, and yeah. how she's responding. Yeah. Yeah, like, so my, my eldest is 12. Mm -hmm. We have made a conscious decision not to allow her to use social media. So 13 is the age that you can begin to use most of the social platforms according to the platform's own yeah. terms of condition. Terms Does she have a smartphone? She has a phone, she uses WhatsApp with her friends, and she uses, you know, some, my, my two younger kids play Roblox, which they love and adore, and there's lots of social interaction, and I, I reserve the right to make sure to check what they're doing, and I do, you know, and I, I don't do it, I don't sneak a look, I like ask them to show me. Mm -hmm. I like sit, I sit and play with them sometimes, and they're talking with their friends primarily, but I worry, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely worry, I keep an eye. My, my oldest girl, I think about, okay, she's going to be joining social, she wants to, some of her friends are already on, she's asked us multiple times, she understands why she doesn't, but she's, you know, in the next year or two, we're going to start having to have those conversations, and I, I would be lying if I said I wasn't worried, yeah. but at the same time, I want her to not be left have, out. Her, have her journey, right, yeah. and make good decisions, right. and give her the best support we can, right, I think she has to go through life, and as a parent, you sort of have to let your kids bump into the walls occasionally to figure out the way, and that's, that's the balance that I'm trying to strike. I mean, I know Ricky's daughter's yeah. quite young. But. She is, but I think about it all the time. So she's only two and a half, obviously very far along. Does she have uh, a phone? Far away. No. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a phone she's and a, a, a phone. TikTok. Um, <laughs> no, but I was just with friends the other day and they have daughters around your, well, a daughter and a son uh, who's 14 and 16. Mm. And their parents have been like, play outside, you don't need a phone, you don't need a phone. And it's getting to the point now, they're in mid late middle school, entering high school, where they are not getting invited to birthday parties and this and that they're because the they're, out of the, they're out of the loop. But they, they know about the birthday party because they still talk about it at right. school. But when they show up, the kid's like, I don't want you in, you're not, on, you're not in the group, you're not on the... Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's like, it's very, and that it's stuff is what really outcast. freaks me out because now it's like, damned if you do, damned if you don't yeah. type of thing. And it's, I think the best way that I can think of today is what you said, like just make sure they're ultra aware yep. of 
like most of the stuff on there is not real and yeah. if it it's designed it's designed to provide value and positive yeah. experiences and if it's only providing negative experiences yeah. that's t it's time to take a breath yeah. and and understand then that you're now and that's the that's the struggle and the challenge of the platform like you don't want to be that place yeah but it it's almost like, especially at certain age groups, you can't help but yeah. be in that place because that's just how yeah. teenagers behave. But it's like, how do you just over-educate and make them, it's like almost like you have to grow up young, it kind of sucks, but it's like, how do you make them aware that that's not real life and there's no, yeah. it's okay to feel sad but also reflect on that sadness and realize it's nonsense. Yeah, one of the lessons I, 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 I taught my kids is you can just block someone like and even on roblox where um, some kid is it's not even mean it's just sort of they don't like th there's no personal feelings just block yeah it's a digital yeah. it's a digital environment no it's one's a digital it. relationship yeah. and I, my kids have struggled they see they felt that blocking someone is this extreme thing yeah like just doesn't matter just yeah. mute them block yeah them, whatever. mute them I'm, I'm, i actually i'm so curious if that's like a generational gap maybe, maybe because i also yeah. feel really strange about blocking I, people. I block people all the time i block family members I, I don't People block me. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, why, I blocked Alec. I <laughs> I, honestly, I, I see this is it's like this is my space. If I don't like what you're saying, or I, you're annoying me, or even the thing you're saying is just like uh, it's uninteresting to me, I'll just block someone. Yeah. Yeah, like on my Twitter that. account, I, and I've had a Twitter account since 2006. I was like one of the first hundred people in Ireland to have one. I've got more blocked people than I have the people that I've ever followed. Yeah. Over, and I just I just like to forget about it. And, and most of the blocks have not been because anyone said anything mean to me or it's just been this, this person's either annoying or uninteresting. Yeah. Mm. And I don't, just don't really just see anything. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I, want, I think it's empowering to say to kids, like, you control your experience, curate your own experience, make it in a way that you enjoy it because you'll keep coming back. And if someone's like making it not so awesome, kick them out the room. That's yeah. true. Now, thinking about the future, like projecting outwards, I've heard of some very interesting projects um, with companies using AI to identify images that, that might have you know, inappropriateness about them and, and, yeah. and stopping them from even being posted. Like, mm -hmm. like the camera detects it, for example, like a FaceTime type engagement that if someone is mm. appearing on FaceTime mm. and they're blurring certain yep. parts out that, cause so that the recipient doesn't get you know, an mm. inappropriate FaceTime call. Yeah. Um, what do you see? Like, where, where is this all going into the future? What do you see being? I mean, I, I think you, the phenomenon that you're sort of referring to is sort of the on-device mm -hmm. level. That's a big one to unpack, and there was a lot of press around that particular company and and that feature of, over the last year or so. I think there is a push and pull between the need to be safe and the and the, and the need to have data privacy and to you want certain channels to be encrypted. Yeah. Like, you know, my phone calls, you know, if I'm using, you know, Signal or Telegram or some other end-to-end -end encrypted channel, you don't, you know, most people aren't comfortable thinking there's some technological layer some in there, mm -hmm. even if that layer is inserted for my safety, you know, mm -hmm. my, for my safety. So I think end-to-end -end encrypted channels is a challenging one, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure where this will, will land. I do think privacy will ultimately trump Things, if you think about just the huge push, particularly in Europe, but now around the world, around GDPR and, yep. and how private information is sort of sacrosanct, I, I, I'm struggling to see where those two things meet in the middle. I have yet to see an elegant solution. But I certainly think companies are, are trying to get to the source sometimes rather than wait for a, ba a report. Like, yep. oh, a bad thing happened and you call the police and the police arrive. It's sort of like, proactive. How do, we, how do we stop it before it happens or yep. how do we stop it as it happens? And actually, you know, one thing is interesting to note, most bad stuff on the internet gets caught before anyone ever sees it. It gets caught at source. So if, on these platforms, if I go and send an inappropriate photo to someone of a DM, a lot of platforms won't let you, you know. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll stop it you. and stop it. Or, or it, even further up the chain, if I'm a known spammer, scammer or bad actor, I won't even be able to sign up. Right. You know, if my IP address is known or my email address is known or some other metadata associated with my account, a lot of bad actors can work around that. But, you know, in principle, you could sign up, you know, a person who's been blocked from some of these platforms for life will go try sign up. They won't be allowed to.
Thank you everyone for being here today to see our fireside chat on trust and safety in the digital age. And thank you guys for being here today to talk about your experience and your take on the space. Thanks, Darian. Yeah, Thanks, Darian. it was fun. Thank you. Yeah.